Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and I am welcomed by two doctors, um, and I'm going to call them doctors of hypertrophy today, because that is what we're going to be talking about. They are not doctors of hypertrophy, they are doctors though. We have Dr. Scott Stevenson, who uh, has been on the podcast many times, and obviously Dr. Mike Isratel, who all of you probably know as well. Um, And I'm very excited to have brought these guys together and actually talk together for the first time because as many of you already will know, because you've listened to them both, they're very, very intelligent, uh, very, very humble guys. And I think it's going to be an incredibly fruitful discussion to hear about their hypertrophy methodologies and whether or not there's any points of kind of discussion to go from there. So um, without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Dr. Scott to hear about your general hypertrophy philosophies, because I know you'll probably go into a lot of detail there, but just the general kind of overview if you have one. You know, I, I could, I could just kind of ramble on. Um, one of the things that I tried to do, Mike, I've listened to a few of your podcasts. You, you, if you are getting what I get on the flip side, people would say, wait, what do you think of Isertel's uh, various bullshit. thoughts on, yeah, bullshit, like all these, <laughs> you know, exactly, maximal <laughs> volume, landmarks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, so I've listened to a few of your podcasts, and it's funny, and I've tried to read between the lines, trying to figure out some uh, – like I said in the in one of the emails, you know, some some controversial topics to uh, make some sound bites for Steve to post up and and get people to click in. It, there's doesn't seem to be anything really major that where we differ. And what I what I what I suspect that I have have gleaned is that the context of the level of experience of the bodybuilding trainee is what people are not picking up on. And that is that things are different when you're one year in or two years in even compared to when you've been training for a decade or 20 years or more than 30 like me. So, um, anyway, as far as, as training goes, um, I think, uh, gosh, where to start? I mean, I could, I could put together all the pieces that I've, I've included in my fortitude training program, which I've done previously. But basically, there has to be some sort of a, uh, a stress overload that is progressive over time, as Mike talks about, um, uh, and it's sort of known for, I think volume is definitely a part of that. There's the dose response curve in terms of training volume. So you have to figure out what training volume you can recover from. It seems uh, in general, and this has been my experience with clients too over time, and some of this has to do simply with sort of the natural history of what I was exposed to. I know, Steve, you put uh, dog crap training is one of our topics to cover um, today. And so DC training is something that I came around to, interestingly enough, about the time when Dante Trudeau was putting that out. And I had come to literally almost all this. I was almost doing DC training to a T minus the rest pause cluster sets. And this was like like 2000. Um, so I found DC training when the internet was first kind of starting to blow up on a, uh, on a discussion board, um, that famous, uh, cycles for pennies thread that people have, have, uh, logged all over the place. And, uh, and I started doing the program in a bastardized form. So my, my, the type of progressive overload that I favored over time has been based sort of on the idea that form follows function and that you're going to have to get stronger in order to get larger to some, some degree. Obviously, it's not a one-to-one strength and muscle size relationship, but, but that progressive overload um, should in some way, shape, or form entail uh, using heavier loads. This is over the course of years. Um, and that the biggest bodybuilders are generally the strongest bodybuilders doesn't always um, work out exactly for everyone. And what's that's meant? And I think this is one thing where where our perspectives may may have um, maybe we've been looking into different fields of bodybuilders, so to speak, almost like a different species of bodybuilders. Is that over the years the people that I have associated with, like our friend Dave Smith, plug to Dave. Um, or the clients who have come to me when I was doing DC training are those who simply because of personality um, proclivities like to train really hard and they enjoy picking up the heaviest, biggest weights they possibly can. So that became a really effective way for them to uh, uh, include progressive overload and to force adaptation. Um, It made sense to me because 
uh, if you look at reasons why this is sort of a teleological argument, why would a muscle grow and in, in increase contractile protein? Well, in some way, shape, or form, the tensile demands on that skeletal muscle um, have become greater. So you can adapt to a muscular endurance type of stress by an enzymatic adaptation, mitochondrial adaptation, increasing glycolytic enzymes, those sorts of things, which you'll see in some of the, some of the studies. And um, interestingly enough, a lot of the early studies of bodybuilders think from what I've seen described, they were doing high volume training systems. Um, so you see those adaptations, unlike what someone who might be doing like a strict DC training, which could be high volume depending on how you warm up. So anyway, the, the bottom line there that I'm getting at is that um, I've always favored progressive overload where the focus with log booking and mentality has been to train as hard as you possibly can with as much volume as you can. That's what I've included in my training system, which differs from DC in a way that um, manifests in getting as strong as possible with as much volume as you can, as you can. And I've got that built into my system. It's another one of the, the, the training system uh, pieces that I have in fortitude training is three different volume tiers to account for that. So I've had, I've had natural competitors who aren't very strong, weren't very big, who are just workhorses and they can train with the highest volume tier that I have in my training system. And I've also had guys who were assisted, who just train like madmen. One guy, uh, basically, that I'm thinking of right now, he would have been a he was he won his class at the Canadian Nationals. Incredible bodybuilder. Um, so basically, ha had he stuck with it, he probably would have become a pro. Um, great physique. He could only handle the lowest volume tier, maybe half the training volume, and still recover. He was using higher loads. He was true. This is the type of guy that you know he, he was hoping that at least got nauseated or even vomited every time he trained because he liked to just be a knucklehead. So that's sort of what I've what I've uh, been exposed to as a, and work with people that works for them. But I think in Mike's case, and I don't want to speak for you, Mike, but um, you can definitely induce a progressive overload type of stimulus by varying the volume in the way that you, that you do and generally suggest people do. And that works really well for people who have better control of the off switch, which I never have. I love to train like an idiot, so to speak, and uh, and push sets to failure. I think that may be a topic we'll cover, um, which, of course, reduces the volume that you can recover from. Absolutely. Some people can do a better job of, of keeping reps in reserve and accumulating volume, all of which can be a phenomenal way of progressive, progressively overloading and manipulate volume more so than using a load focused approach for progressive overload. So I believe that there's, as I think you've said too, Mike, in some of the podcasts, there's tremendous variability and recovery abilities. Um, I've got a, a whole lecture I've done on biological interindividuality in terms of everything from muscle protein synthesis to muscle growth, um, drugs, pretty much anything you look at that you can expose to humans at uh, as a form of a, a sort of a stimulus or a stress, there's going to be a highly variable um, response. So you have to take that into account. That's what I have in my training system. That's why some people would do better with a volume overload than a, a progressive overload with higher loads, less reps in reserve. So I favor generally with the people I've worked with who tend to like to do this, Progressive overload with a, with a with a loading focus, a higher frequency, probably a lower volume, and um, and then we could talk about periodization, et cetera, et cetera. But but basically, I think we're on the same page. A lot of things, Mike. Tell me if I've if I've stuck my foot in my mouth. But I I think uh, I think we fall in line in a lot of ways. I'll just right. leave it at that. There's so much more to cover. I don't want to ramble for the whole the whole time here. <laughs> no, that, that's great, and I think it gives a good overview of your kind of methodologies for lack of a better term just um and then yeah i don't know if mike you've got any thoughts on what uh, has been said there by scott yeah really really, really great stuff scott so um i think i one of the things i can put some sort of insight into i was going to say clarification but i'm not so sure i ever really said this in too many podcasts because like you accurately represented most of my audience tends to be folks that are you know, maybe not beginners, but definitely intermediates, three to five years of training. Um, and maybe a bit more recreational than the folks that you generally deal with. And um, 
So uh, in uh, one of our, this is definitely covered in one of our books, but fuck reads the books. Um, I don't even know how to read. So. The podcasts are for, right? Exactly. <laughs> fuck reading. So um, the uh, minimum effective volume that you start out with when you start training is basically like one set per body part per week. Like if you just do a set of squats for several weeks, you will grow just to one working set per week. Mm -hmm. But as you get more mature as an athlete, you know, the minimum effective volume starts to go up. When you get really strong, the number of sets it takes to exceed your fatigue uh, recovery abilities actually starts to decline. Um, you know, if you're stand efforting, you're not doing 10 by 10 of 800 pounds. It's just, you're just not, nobody's doing that. Right. Right. So, at, at, so there's that interesting curve there. In addition, there's the maximum recoverable volume, which if we're counting by number of sets at first is very small, which is why beginners can do something like sort of five, three, one ish and grow really well for a couple of years. But then it usually starts to grow for most people. And through the intermediate years is where I think most people have their highest by counted by set number because they're not so, so strong yet. Their highest maximum recovery volumes. Like, you know, I'm sure you guys have read articles where guys like, yeah, man, my biceps grew the most when I trained them with 40 working sets per week. And we're like, what the fuck? But then you look at their weights and they're like, okay, I can also recover from 10 pound curls, 40 fucking sets per week. It's fine. But uh, so, but then, you know, your MRV is as far as set numbers per week, probably declines somewhat when you get freaky, freaky strong. So individuals that can should be progressing a lot in volume are people from the beginner into the intermediate into the early advanced stage. But as we go into the very advanced stage, your minimum effective volume starts to really climb and your maximum recoverable starts to fall if we're counting by set numbers. You're left with this really small band, like for someone as advanced as you, Scott, maybe 10 sets of hamstrings is just not enough to get adaptations, but 14 sets is just too much to recover from. So you may be in the 11, 12, 13 range. Like for myself, that's a fine example. Like mm -hmm. if I go too low, it just doesn't do shit. If I go too high, my body's like, well, what the fuck? So for most people in their beginner intermediate range, I mean, there's like a 20 set difference between their minimum effective volume, which they could get some growth with and a maximum recoverable. As you get more advanced, the, the, the range tends to close, which is why progressing by adding sets every week for really advanced folks is just not a tenable thing. It's, they might add like two sets per month, not 10. So that's definitely a thing that can describe some of the differences in training um, approach. You can definitely smash volume as an overload print variable by itself for folks that have a big volume window. But for folks with a smaller one towards the, uh, you know, very advanced parts of their careers development, it's less of a thing. Here's another consideration. People that tend to be slightly have uh, more slower twitch fibers, um, they actually adapt to volume in the literal sense very quickly. They get enhanced vascularization with training over the course of days and weeks. And so their uh, maximum recoverable volume given a certain set rep scheme, uh, sorry, given a certain rep scheme with exercises, it just climbs until you, and you hit a plateau. So you start them off with like five sets of squats and they get nice and sore. The next week, if you don't do six or seven sets of squats, they basically don't feel anything because their adaptation is super fast. People who are more fast twitch dominant, lots of faster twitch muscle fibers, they generally don't tend to adapt to volume very quickly. So if you smash more sets into them, they're just going to exceed their maximum recoverable volume and just shit the bed for lack of a better term. So people that tend to be more fast twitch dominant and people that tend to be more advanced uh, probably benefit a little bit more from not changing volume by set numbers much as they go over the weeks of training, but adding load preferentially. In addition to that, there's some good reasoning to think that faster twitch muscle fibers respond better to just absolute load increases as a way of growing than metabolites, lactic acid, and stuff like that. And because they have a very low volume window of adaptation and doing a bunch of drop set burnout shit probably doesn't work that well with them, individuals that are more fast twitch dominant and advanced they're just like gonna have to bench the 150s on incline dumbbell press one week and then the next week they're just gonna have to do like the 155s or some shit or add a rep maybe and then next week 155s and then they're gonna be like coach how do we get my chest bigger you're like i guess you just have to bench the 170s at some point it's the only way it's gonna happen whereas mm -hmm. for folks in more intermediate ranges they can 
certainly add weight to the bar, but they can also add sets and stuff like that and even add reps. And it's okay because they're not as fast, which and not as advanced. They still get really great progress like that. So I think when people say, well, you know, all I can recover from is like eight sets per week. And, uh, you know, I, I've got to get stronger and train heavy. Uh, those two individuals, that, that tends to work better for advanced individuals that almost by selection are more faster twitch. Like mm. slower twitch guys don't make it to the IFBB, man. Like you, you, you're never going to be that big if you're slow twitch dominant. The slow twitch fibers just don't grow as much. So when people see like Ronnie Coleman training super heavy, yeah, that works for Ronnie Coleman because Ronnie Coleman is probably some freaky combination of fast twitch fibers of almost no slow twitch fibers. Not everyone's like that. So if you copy him and you're not of that disposition, maybe that won't work so well. And, and, and one last thing, uh, the difference in training to failure, when you train closer to failure as a beginner, you risk injury much more because you don't have stable technique because you don't know what the fuck you're doing. You don't even know what failure is. And you know, you've seen like failure on a deadlift or, or a bent row for a guy that's got uh, 20 years of training is like, Oh, that's it. It's not moving. But for a guy that's two months of training, he's like, I can still do it. You fucking question mark back shoots up and he right. shits his guts out. And you're like, God damn, you probably put most of those back in there before we take you to the hospital. Um, and then, so that's a, maybe not such a great thing. And in addition to that, there might be no need for it. Well, so there's other problems, like they learn really poor technique if they just grind to failure all the time. And they're like, yeah, I know how to deadlift. And they're like, you don't even know how to lift weights. So, um, and then, but for more advanced people, because they have the control, someone like uh, Jordan Peters comes to mind. And because just training hard probably doesn't cut it anymore. As you approach a system's maximal adaptive abilities, the stimulus presentation probably has to be more and more superlative. Like when you're a beginner, you just give some stimulus and your body's like, sweet, we're growing, right? But as you're super advanced, your body's like, fuck you. And you're like, you're gonna have to almost die for any growth to happen. And it's like, okay, fine, fine, go to failure, fine, I'll grow just a little bit. So I think there's more of an advantage of going closer to failure more regularly when you're very advanced as long as your technique is really good and trying to get a little bit stronger over time. I think everyone should be getting stronger over time. Beginners for sure, intermediates for sure, advanced for sure. For advanced, that just might be the only thing they have left because they can't add any more sets. They can't add sets to begin with. And because mm -hmm. adding reps takes them way out of the rep range that's optimal for their fiber type, that might not work so well. Like you get a great chest pump with sets of eight. You're like, fuck it, I'll just do more reps until I get to 15. You go to 15, you just get tired. You don't even have a pump. And you're like, well, this is fucking stupid. I, there's no way for me to avoid just using more weight on sets of eight. So I think that because I talk to this population here, beginners and immediate a lot, we do a lot of cycling by sets and always cycling with weight, of course, adding, getting stronger. I think the population maybe you're talking to a little bit more, the elite guys up here, a lot of those options are just not options for them. But how many guys would turn you down and be like, wait a minute, I can go like four F shy of failure and do just a bunch more sets and I can still grow with zero injury risk pretty much? You'd be like, yeah. I'd be like, well, fuck, get me started. The thing is a lot of those guys, after three weeks, they'll be like, how do you feel? They're like, I just feel tired. Like, did you get bigger? They're like, no. They're like, fuck, I guess it didn't work. So I think it's it, there's definitely something to say for those differences. I, I, I wonder what you think about all that rationale. Yeah, I, I like a lot of that. I'm, I'm thinking that when, I mean, I know you have people come at you and um, a lot of times those guys are, are the more prominent figures on discussion boards or maybe on Facebook and, and they can be that in a certain, they have a little more bravado because they are bigger bodybuilders is those guys probably don't recognize what you just said, that, that you, the, the context of who you were speaking to um, in terms of, in terms of manipulating volume to produce the, the progressive overload to produce muscle size gains that, that whole, that whole clip right there is maybe one that could, could be bookmarked for many, many people and, and prevent you a lot of pain and misery online. If you, if you bother to respond to some of these folks, well, I don't hear any of it. So, <laughs> okay, good, good. I, I don't just, me. okay, there you go. You know, it's interesting. I would, I would love, it's so unfortunate, I guess, and this is this for my, uh, my, uh, my intellectual um, selfishness that we don't have more muscle biopsies from high level bodybuilders because a lot of the like always stuff from years ago, there's so many studies that have been done. There's one uh, Italian group who's done some work and looked at, at bodybuilders and muscle fiber types and it, it didn't fit with what you often find that bodybuilders tend to have a lot of type one fibers. Um, that are large and uh, what you say as far as the greater both potential and type twos and I think what you say as far as a lot of larger bodybuilders 
having probably a lot of type twos makes sense. I mean, I'm thinking like Dave Henry, for instance, someone who was a really good sprinter right off the bat. Sure. And that pretty much dictates a lot of type two. Yeah, exactly. Those kinds of guys. So I, I wonder what's going on. There's also some interesting data. If And of course, this is, you know, this is a stretch. I'm not saying this is necessarily entirely externally valid. But if you look at like, um, you may be familiar with the study that Jose Antonio did with uh, weighted quail where they progressively overloaded the weights on the wing. And they, they increased uh, the anterior latissimus dorsi size by like 300% in like six weeks. Literally, is the, yeah, quail gains exactly. But the thing that happened there, of course, was there's a, a massive shift towards type one myosin, um, and that sort of matched what I imagine a lot of those bodybuilders were doing in those studies that showed that they had a lot of type one large fibers. Um, so there's limited. There's some some connection maybe that higher volume would would then shift fiber type. And that's, that is possible. We didn't think it was possible a decade ago, but there's possible some shifts from type two to type one. That's maybe a suggestion. There's also the idea, of course, that those, those, um, there's some data that large bodybuilders don't have large type one fibers. They just have lots, lots of fibers. Um, and their fibers are the same size as untrained controls. Um, some of that is like always data, I believe, which is kind of bizarre. It, it's suggestive of how did this happen? Is this a hyperplasia effect? Like what's going on here? Um, and of course, that's what happens with um, uh, that's what happens with the overload data. So I, I really would love to get more like what what was the fiber type in Tom Platz's quads? Wouldn't sure. that be phenomenal to know? You know, the guy who could you know put two qu- two and a quarter on the bar and squat for ten minutes straight. Yeah, um, that's a massive feat. It's he had incredible strength, but you know when he did the Fred Hatfield squat off, you know he got beat. He didn't have the greatest one rep max. Tremendous quads, maybe the best developed legs of all time. Uh, m- many people wouldn't argue against that, but I wonder what his fiber type was. I really do, or how it changed over the course of his training. So, yeah, so, yeah that's it question marks there I, that I can't answer, but I would just love to have more data. And the thing is the high level body boost, they don't want to, they don't want biopsies taken. I've, I've taken biopsies from both of my, I have holes in my vastus lateral on both sides from doing biopsies. And, you know, it, obviously it, it hasn't prevented me from, uh, from competing, but you know, I'm not in any close, been close to winning a Mr. Olympia either. So yeah, people don't want to do those spot. Yeah, go ahead. I was offered to do biopsies when I was a grad assistant. I was like, fuck you guys. I was just absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. It would have been interesting though. I mean, if you could sure. just know, I mean, they can, they can do small, those probably with the larger, like the old school bear. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And those, they can do smaller biopsies now, of course. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't, they have other techniques they can use to take out a micro biopsy. It's not nearly as large. So yeah. it still sounds terrible. Those yeah, my games, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I fished around because I, I had to practice the technique on myself. So I, I, I got some nice holes in in each each leg from Excellent. just making myself, yeah, nice, right, making myself into a lab rat. So sacrificing to win, Scott. Um, if yeah, I can just know. butt in, I just want yes. to see if I can somehow summarize that for the listeners because um, I was trying to keep pace with it, and uh, I think the listeners probably do a summary there in that potentially when they're hearing the differences potentially between your methodologies, it's because of the audience you're speaking to um, and therefore they can sometimes misapply it. So potentially sometimes you'll see people going down maybe the route of kind of very low intensity, uh, low uh, volumes or lower volumes, very high intensities as maybe a more novice lifter when they maybe benefit from more of the lower relative intensities, the higher amounts of volume potentially. It's just about really finding an amount of volume you can perform at, recover from and improve from um, and over the long term getting strong. Is that an okay summary? I don't know if uh, Mike, you want to kind of go over. Yeah, I think it was. I think it's just uh, when you are a beginner, you can progress in multiple ways at the same time. You can add sets, you can add weight. Sometimes you can add reps too, but the weight and reps are really a trade off of each other because you know you can add more of one or less of the other, all of one or none of the other. As you get more advanced, the walk you take from the beginning of a mesocycle to the end of it in terms of number of sets gets shorter and shorter and shorter eventually, right? As you become 
from beginner to intermediate, it grows. But as you go from intermediate to advanced to very advanced, that starts to shrink again. So that towards the peak of your advancement, man, you really just have like this minimum amount of sets you have to do to get send the message. And the maximum you can recover from is just really close to that. Sometimes it's so close that you basically have like, you, you know, guys know this too. And like um, the IFBB, they'll be like, like, how many sets do you do for your back? And they're like, like 15. And they're like, well, why don't you do 18? They're like, I can't recover from 18. They're like, why don't you do 12? Like, because I don't get anything from 12. And you're like, how the fuck can it be that tight? Well, theory would predict that it would have to get that tight because the minimum amount of stimulus you have to give a muscle for it to continue to grow goes up through entire your entire training history, right? Like if someone says like, you know, I want to squat uh, 200 pounds. I currently squat 150. How much is it going to take work-wise to get from 150 to 200? Not much. What about from 1,000 to 1,050? It could take heaven and earth. Like It could actually take hypothetically so much stimulus that your ability to recover from it is lower than that, and you just will never get that much better. That's where anabolics enter the picture. It's like, uh, here's how big you, here's how much work you'd have to do to be Mr. Olympia. Only with all these drugs will you ever be able to survive that much work. So that's definitely a possibility. So as you become, go from beginner to intermediate to very advanced, you essentially used to, you know, raise your volume considerably and drop it, raise it considerably and drop it as far as number of sets. You can't do that anymore. So the fluctuations get either really small or to simplify things, you stop fluctuating. So instead of going from 10 sets to 20 sets a week, and then repeating, you might be stuck right around 15, which are just increasing weight on the bar. And you might be increasing weight on the bar by smaller fractions than you used to. Uh, something I've done, you know, uh, uh, potentially it also like, you know, there's barbells versus dumbbells thing. Like if you're doing lateral raises with the 30s, you know, they, you don't just go to the 35s next week, right? Like, you're not like doing sets of 10 with the 30s. And then what do you do with the 35s? Sets of five? Nobody does laterals from sets of five. It's ridiculous. So then what do you do? Well, you might do the 30s for like two or three months and go from, you know, sets of 10 to like sets of 15 to 20. And then once you know, in bodybuilding circles, they call you can handle the 30s really easily. You move up to the 35s and just do a rep progression from there. Like, do you want to do the magnetic weights and slap them on? Yeah, sure. You can do that. But there's something to be said for beating the log book either on weight or on reps. Cause you know, it's funny for intermediate, they don't even understand that concept. They're like, why not both? Like, well, fucking shit, you cocksucker. Of course, but why don't I just do 10 times the volume too and fucking magically lift the weights with my mind. This is just some shit you're just not getting anymore when you become more advanced. It's funny. I did a podcast with uh, Abel side by, uh, oh, sorry, Abel, I didn't pronounce your last name. Um, <laughs> So we we're talking about the road to getting to advanced. How do you get to advanced? I had to like really rephrase a bunch of the way we were speaking. So you don't want to be advanced. <laughs> it's not like some fucking badge of honor. You don't want to be advanced. You you want to be that guy in the Olympia stage who's getting twentieth, but is basically a beginner. So that when you go to advanced, you win the Olympia eight times. Like I remember Ronnie Coleman asked him what he did to win his first Olympia. He was like, I hired a nutritionist. They're like, you didn't have one? He's like, no, I just kind of ate what I thought was a good idea. Like, fuck, can you imagine a guy who looks like Ronnie coming up to you and you're like, so what's your protocol? He's like, what's a protocol? And you're like, right, you're going to be the greatest bodybuilder of all time. So it's, it's one of these things where as you become more advanced, your options get more limited. Is there some nuance? Maybe you could talk about this, talking about maybe is going to failure super often a good idea versus maybe trying to keep some reps in the tank, even at those low volumes and, and heavy weights. Maybe that may be a really good discussion, but I think we're largely in agreement about the fact that like, yeah, ideally you progress through all these variables, but when you get to be really big and strong, man, you just kind of weight or maybe reps is kind of the only thing left because progressing through sets is just unrealistic. Your, your volume landmarks are just too close together. You just won't recover from any more. Any less is just not enough. Was that fair, Scott? Go yeah. Ahead, I, I like what Mike, Mike said there. One of the things, and I'm going to risk evoking some, some hashtags here, but um, the people that I found that do the best um, getting from, a little bit better than intermediate to becoming really impressive as bodybuilders, the guys who can really sort of grind with the micro loading over time. Um, and the ones that maybe, you know, for whatever reason, you know, their brains are not wired to need immediate gratification and like to, you know, have gone up a plate on each side of the leg press every time they go in the gym. And it's the guys that will report back to me. If you literally look back at um, the exercise there, they've chosen and I will, typically this has happened in DC training and I've stuck by this in part of my fortitude training system 
is you'll have like three rotations for a given muscle group. So they'll come back to the same exercise. And let's say one of those is, is a squat, barbell squat, and they're using, you know, 405 and they're doing sets of 10 with that and we'll leave kind of the other details out. And so they, then they, you know, they, they micro load with, with one and a quarter pound plates or two and a half pound plates and they just keep on. And of course this has got to be coupled with food. There's got to be a body weight increase too, which, a lot of people don't recognize you. How many times you got in the question? You know, it's like how, you know, I've been training, you know, for two years and my arms haven't gotten any bigger. And oh, how much has your body weight changed? Well, it hasn't. I'm like, well, okay. You know, it hasn't changed the last year. You can get those newbie gains without much body weight change to a certain degree because you lose body fat. But uh, eventually you're going to have to um, gain some, gain some weight as well. So it's those people who are eating to support the gains and who are willing to kind of hang in there on those exercises that they have the sense to work for them. Um, they got good mind muscle connection. Maybe they sense soreness in the target muscle, all the things that indicate they've got a good exercise for eliciting growth. They're actually seeing it as well. And who, you know, it's say every three weeks they use, they go from 405 and they use 410 and they maybe just go up a very small amount. This doesn't work well for 30 pound dumbbells. Um, you could use, you know, plate mates and that sort of thing. You have to work within a range, but they get, they go from 10 reps to 12 reps to 13 reps and maybe they stagnate for a week but they don't give up they realize they had a shitty week because they had a long day at work or what have you and then they get 14 reps and 15 reps and then they move up and they drop back to nine and like they literally they, they, they inchworm their way forward you do that let's say you train a, a, an exercise every three weeks and you just add five pounds and you do that uh, 15 times in a year well, what is that? Five times 15 is 45 pounds. You've just gone up basically a quarter on each side from 405 to let's say 455 roughly on a squat. If you could do that and even half that the next year, there will be the law of diminishing gains. But the next year you get half that. And now you're, you went from 455 to 475 and the next year you're at 495. So in, that, in three years in this hypothetical example, four or five for a set of 10 is a pretty good squat. It's not bad at all, especially if you're going all the way down. And, um, you know, this, if, of course, this works for, for training your quads. But now in three years, you've gone from 405 to a 495 or maybe a 515 squat. That's going to show up if your form and tempo and depth and all those things are still the same. So those are the, the guys that can do that, I think, um, who can progressively over that load in that way. Um, are the ones that, that do really well in the long haul in three years. You know, to become a really good bodybuilder, it can obviously take a decade for many people who don't have, like, Ronnie Coleman-type genetics. So, yeah, I would add that. And, the, and as far as the um, reps in reserve versus reps to failure, I think we're on the same page there, too. What I've actually done with fortitude training um, uh, to sort of ensure that – people don't really dig into their reserves by, um, by doing um, lots of reps that are very close to a failure point is constrained. I have different set types, Mike. So there's like a loading set, which is just kind of a heavy straight set. I've got a, a cluster set that's based off of a, an old system. I've kind of come up with a way to do a cluster set where you only have one failure point among what would be roughly six sets of four interspersed by about five seconds or five breaths or 10 seconds rest, and then a higher rep kind of a pump set. Um, and those can be kind of weighed to make things fun and entertaining and, and interesting to ensure a mind muscle connection. Uh, Dave Smith does this training plan. So you guys may have talked about it at some point, but I, I constrain people to keeping those reps continuous during the set. So they don't inch up towards a failure point, which which you do actually in DC training with like widow makers, for instance, you want to basically make, make it look like from out the outward appearance that you're trying to kill yourself and make your wife into a widow and doing a widow maker. That's not what I want people to do in fortitude training with any of the set types is that you do continuous reps and you don't eke out those really those reps that are kind of diabolical for your nervous system that translates to immune and endocrine, so other, et cetera, other perturbations. And, in that way, um, you can stop with one to two reps in reserve. And the way I set it up, for instance, for loading sets is that you only have a single failure failure set that's done safely, of course. No, you know, crazy non you know non spotted like squats in the open space squat rack type of of garbage. And you would do that, and that would help you to guide your progressive overload. And of course, you wouldn't do crazy reps, of course. Um, you know, where you 
you are you're failing just to, for the sake of your of ego failing. There may be a, a a rep where you're like, there is no way in hell I'm getting another one. I'm not going to go down and just drop into the hole for the sake of saying that I failed. That would be silly. So I trained actually Jordan Peters, and the way the way he does that is very very smart. He he knows after having trained for years, he'll take a set to failure where the next rep would be failure. Not everyone can do that, but. I limit the failures, the failure points to like one per cluster set. Um, the pump sets a little bit different because those are very light loads, but literally only one failure point where you, where you have to put the weight down. And then when doing like heavy straight sets, compound movements like a deadlift or a squat or have you, only one failure point. Um, and the other sets would be one to two reps in reserve when the sets are done continuously because I, I learned this a long time ago when I was just starting out training with this, this sort of system that I used when I was a, a kid in high school that like once you fail or once you get close to those that failure point or too close it just it just wrecks your performance there on it the inroads to use a, a mensarian term where now we're invoking both hashtags and mike menser um is just can be such so much more it's exponential i think the closer you get to failure that you have to be really really careful but when you're that advanced person um, which is mainly who I'm kind of speaking to or someone who's willing who wants to go there where you've got this law of diminishing returns where your 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 minimum effective volume and your your maximum the maximum volume you can recover from are so narrow then you're gonna have to really push your limits in a certain way and, and teeter and balance um, and so that's where having some failure points I think can be helpful especially if you're if you're using the logbook as your progressive overload guide so those are two points that uh, I wanted to follow up with. Fantastic. And I think that was really well explained about how it's not every single set taken to failure and you have like things in place to make sure that you're not getting kind of really diminishing returns in terms of volume. And I know something you wrote in Fortitude was to quote um, the notion that maximizing muscular stress while minimizing neurological effects. So that's kind oh, of something that Mike's talked about before. I, I kind of linked it to like the high stimulus to fatigue ratio in terms of just training in general. Um, so hearing that and reflecting upon it being an advanced lifter, lifter makes very good sense. And I know Mike, you kind of have a more systematic way through weeks in terms of when you hit failure points. Um, if you kind of want to maybe reflect on what Scott said and describe that system a little bit. Yeah, sure. I think, I think it was a very, very great description. Um, I think that so the way I do it most of the time, is I start folks about four or five reps in reserve at the beginning of their training month or mesocycle. And because anything easier than that is kind of just probably the stimulus to fatigue ratio isn't great because the stimulus is so low that you're just doing what basically is junk volume. Mm. Um, so, uh, and then once they start to apply overload and accumulate fatigue over the course of weeks, um, because they're adding weights to the bar usually because they're adding sets in many cases. And because in some cases they're adding reps, but TV can circulate more and more. And in order to continue to overload, do more than you did last week or last workout, you have to start approaching failure more closely. It basically happens naturally. If you do work off the logbook and target to meet or beat your past performance. Okay. So then, you know, you're three reps from failure a week or two in two reps from failure, one from failure slash two failure in a safe exercise. And then after that, you literally are incapable of producing another overload because you're too fatigued and you have to do a deload or some sort, sort of way of altering your uh, accumulated fatigue to reduce it. And then once you've reduced it significantly, usually a week of easier training, then you go back through that progression, start with four or five reps from failure and go all the way uh, into, into thin air again. Um, it, 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 and you, there's other ways of doing this. You can choose to start really close to failure, but not a huge percentage of your program is trained to failure. And you can just overload, overload, overload until you can't beat the logbook anymore and you have to deload because fatigue is too high. Um, you can not progress through to failure as quickly, but then you have to take more conservative jumps and load or in reps or in sets. And there's a trade off there. But I think uh, you, there has to be a recognition of the fact that if you do too much to failure too soon in your progression, you're just going to burn out real quick and have to deload more often 
which means your ratio of the amount you deload over the year to the amount that you're actually training hard becomes really shitty. I mean, I'm Scott, I'm sure you've seen this and I want to call them beginner, not beginner trainees, but just stupid fucking people who always bite off more than they can chew. And they're like, I'm doing Jay Cutler's program. And then a week later, they're like, fuck a deload, bro. That shit was hard. And they're like, I'm doing Ronnie Coleman's program. Like next week, like fuck a deload, man. That shit beat me up. Like, and you realize you deload half of the year, like so. Like <laughs> it means you only grow half the year. You don't grow during deloads, and they're like, right, okay. Like, why don't you set up a sustainable progression that you can train at least three weeks and one deload week? You know, maybe more than that. Um, and then there's the other crowd of people that don't understand the fact that you have to do accumulative fatigue, you have to contend with it. And like, for example, one time I was doing a, I think this is just a like, old infographic I made about how to progress over the weeks. And there's a few examples of rep progression, set progression, and then weight progression. And it was a four to one paradigm. So it was four accumulation weeks and then one deload week. And like a couple of people were like, I use a 12 to one paradigm. Like 12 to one. So you progress linearly for 12 weeks. And they're like, yes, I'm like, Oh, are you Superman? How the fuck are you doing that? <laughs> Either you're Superman or you're starting off so much easier than would be remotely optimal. Like, yeah, like if I started squatting 100 pounds, I could progress for a year until I was doing 500 for reps. But how much of that is stimulative? Well, the last month, maybe the last two. Right. So it's one of those things that once you understand how fatigue constrains us and you understand that there has to be an application of overload, you can choose how close to failure you start out with. It just has to be an intelligent decision. And the one thing I'd like to, to say and, and maybe get your guys' thoughts on is I, I think a really cool, maybe not principle, but maybe sort of parable here is whatever workout you're doing right now has to meet two criteria in your brain. Two thoughts have to happen. One, is this a good workout to cause muscle growth or strength or whatever I'm trying to do right now? Two, how does this set me up for my next workouts? Ooh. And if you don't have that second thought, I just don't think you're involved in training. You're just involved in having a good time at the gym. It's like guys whose technique absolutely blows and they do a grinder set of deadlifts and they do like six and a half reps and drop and go, fuck, yeah. I just want to be like, so what are you going to do next week? I know the answer is dick because they just basically injured themselves. Then it's mm. one of those things like there's absolutely a time for going to failure, but it has to be in a measured, calculated way. And you have to have a realistic beat the logical kind of approach. You're like, okay, I did – 200 pounds this week for 10. It was really tough. I think next week I can do 202.5 or 205. As long as you don't have unrealistic expectations and you plan ahead, I think you're off to a pretty good start. I was just going to say that's great, Mark. I don't know if you have something to say, Scott. Go for it. Yeah, I was thinking it reminded me. Um, so when people are – something that happens now and again when people are doing fortitude training, and I can't blame them. When you, people go to the gym. Sometimes for me it's just a therapy day, and I just want to go in and just be a bit of a knucklehead. And, and I've – you know, that's sort of – weight training and, and going to the gym has done that for me most of my life. But when you're, when you're, doing, when you're doing things in, in the way that Mike suggested where you're thinking about what the – is the workout in itself going to be productive and that it, it fits in some plan for the future. Um, those programs then have you riding some kind of a wave. I think I may even use this analogy with the client. So you're sort of riding a wave of adaptation. And sometimes I've had clients then, and they just have an opportunity to go and train with someone else. So fortitude training is a relatively high frequency program. So you would train legs, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday different oh set types, different rep ranges. Yeah. Um, so you're not doing a lot though. You might do at the lowest volume. So you might do one set of squats, a set of knee extension, see a hamstring curls. And then you would come go and do like uh, two, two cluster sets on Wednesday. Um, and then you, or you do some pump sets, sorry, one, one or two pump sets, one pump set actually in that volume tier. And then you'd have maybe two muscle rounds on Friday. So it's not a lot for each and and people can recover from that and i because i've seen it i mean have they been doing it for years and years and years but if you then go and you train with someone who's going to train legs on friday and they're doing like a once a week volume type of training program and especially if you're someone who really likes to train hard you're riding that nice wave that you've been riding all of a sudden this this one workout is a tsunami and it'll just fuck you up your rating of of uh of um recovery your perceived recovery status i use a, a perceived re recovery status scale that uh, you may be familiar with laurent i think was the 
author on that when it first was introduced and validated. Um, we'll go like, we'll drop down. Some, you can basically bring a mesocycle or a blast, as I call them, to a screeching halt yeah. just with one idiot workout. Um, it could be fun. And you may have to do it because you have a chance to train with someone who's a pro who's better than you and you get an Instagram, what have you, out of it. But, uh, but it can, like, that. I mean, Scott, I love that, like, really dated way to explain that. Like, Instagram, what have you, whatever the fuck these people do on Instagram nowadays. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm on there. I, reluctantly, sure, same I, here. I, if, I, if I could, I wouldn't be on social media, but, you know, Agreed. I make the best of it. But, um, yeah, so so I understand that, like, you, you have a, an opportunity that you have to take or it's just going to be too much fun. Like, sometimes, I mean, gosh, I was, this was just kind of what the hell it was a blast. I was in at the Arnold. It was the day, uh, the main day was Saturday. I went and I trained with John Meadows. We filmed some stuff. We had some fun. We did some videos. We ate pancakes. It was a blast. I went back to his house and I just like napped. I'm, we were going to like go to the, the night show to watch the actual bodybuilding show. And all the guys, Fouad Abiyad and Antoine and all the guys from Canada, they wanted to train that night. And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> okay. So we went and trained yeah, again. It was a blast. It. It didn't matter, you know. I just rested a couple of days, and it was totally fine. So I took advantage of that. It was like, if I die today, this would be great. We went and had sushi after that and sorbet. I had pancakes, sushi, and sorbet all in one day and got to train with, like, five IFBB pros who were all fun as shit. So every once in a while, you just got to live. But it can throw you off. I had to take care of um, recovering for the next three or four days. I don't think I trained for maybe four days after that because I had to. I just trained my whole body, basically. Um, in those two workouts all in one day. We're in the gym for like five hours, you know, yeah. just being crazy. So I, I feel like a lot of people seem to think they have those kinds of special circumstances every week for no yeah. good fucking reason, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that may be, yeah. And that's, you know, that's obviously going to bring their their um, uh, progress to a screeching halt. Um, yeah, one, one thought that, you know, that I've incorporated in the program, I think you were kind of with me with this, uh, Mike, is that um, – if you look at the literature, for instance, like you can make a comparison with how well animals grow in response or an adaptation to resistance training. There are some rodent animals of resistive overload where they've trained rats with like weights on their back. And um, Wong and Booth had like a, a plantar flexion study with e -STEM. You can You can basically see that the rate, at least in the short term, you know, three months or so, even like Gagne stuff with cats and the wrist flexion. Gagne's cats, yeah. Yeah, Gagne's cats. You get the roughly the same um, magnitude of muscle growth in those rodents as you do in humans on the whole um, in terms of the percent changes in, in muscle size. But you can do a compensatory overload type of model, which you really can't do with humans, where, for instance, you clip the soleus and let the gastroc grow. Um, and you get tremendous muscle growth that, you know, will be a hundred percent in a matter of months. And it totally, it supersedes any need for even hormones or insulin. You can hypophysectomize those rats. They've got no growth hormone. They've got no thyroid. You can uh, give them streptozotocin. They've got no insulin. So now they're diabetic, um, lacking the pituitary and the muscle still grows just as well because the overload is so tremendous. So all this kind of tells me that, you know, that one of the things that we just can't do that we have to manage in the gym is we can't overload the muscle in the way that might be more optimal for producing muscle growth if we believe that if if you could overload human muscle in the way that you can these animals that you would get the same kind of adaptive response that you get in those animals given that they respond similarly we do in terms of resistance training there's one piece of information that I found. I could send you this study if you haven't seen it. That was I thought was pretty cool, and it was a, a tendon transfer um, study where people had torn their Achilles and couldn't be reattached. So they used the flexor hallucis longus tendon and reattached that at the calcaneus to serve as a plantar flexor. And it was just a, basically a cross-sectional study of people who had had that surgery. And that muscle, it was highly variable, Probably some of it's just based on their biomechanics and maybe some of those innervation issues. But there was there were some individuals who had, compared to the contralateral leg, about a hundred percent increase in the cross-sectional area of that flexor hallucis longus muscle, which is this is basically the same thing as that compensatory overload. Um, as close as you could get, people aren't going to volunteer to get their 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 soli taken out to see how much the grass stock grows. Yeah, I don't need them. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah, what are you paying me? 
So, so there is, there is something to say that the muscle could handle a lot more than we could just give it. You can't go in the gym and train all the time, all day. Like, like basically what you're doing when you're walking around with a cut soleus or cut gastroc or what have you. So we have to fashion our training based on our recovery ability, which is, you know, that's your wheelhouse. Absolutely. Um, which is a really a kind of a function of, of the stresses that are transferred through our central nervous system that then would manifest in our endocrine system and all these things that are really kind of this, this nebulous overreaching overtraining syndrome, which we, as far as I can tell, especially when it comes to resistance training, we don't have a very good handle on like where that is, what its origin is um, necessarily. I think it's, you know, multi-systemic to a certain degree. So I just want to throw that out as a topic because I think that might be something you've got some interesting thoughts on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, um, there's kind of a little bit of a difference of different kinds of fatigue and their locations. You know, we could talk about um, a peripheral or what was the, I think better term is local fatigue. Like is your quad fucked up the actual muscle itself? And then there's uh, systemic fatigue, which is like, does leg training fuck the rest of you up? Like if you train quads and glutes hard, is it more difficult to train your biceps hard? Are your biceps more limited in their recovery just because you fucked up the rest of your body? And I think that in the beginners uh, and intermediates, it's just really hard. Even the, the ratio of their gastrointestinal system size to their muscle is just unimpressive. And they, they you know, the, the nutrient supply is great. The amount of physical damage they can do is that extensive. It's not that strong. There's not that much muscle uh, volume to, to disrupt. So it ends up being like, they don't really touch their systemic, you know, uh, maximum recoverable volume pr- very often. It's just really hard. You just have to work really hard when you're not super strong to get your systemic, uh, maximum recovery volume. But when you're very advanced, gee, you know, two hard sets of deadlifts can just what? make your quad work three days later, like a moot point. You just start warming up in the leg press. You're like, I don't got it. Whatever it is, I don't have it. <laughs> I mm-hmm. might be able to do some pump work. And this is, I think, great part of your system that cycles through the different kinds of work. Because some right. people like, we fucking grind every day, brother. Like, okay, that's not physiologically possible, but thanks so much for your time. <laughs> like, no days off. Like, okay, <laughs> you're an idiot. But uh, so it's... Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. I forgot the hashtag. How, how, <laughs> how old school of me. So it's one of these things where I think as you become more advanced in, in, in systemic fatigue, it, like you said, is quite mysterious still. There's almost certainly a central nervous system component. There's probably a blood component uh, to the effect of cytokines. And for mm-hmm. those of you not in the know, cytokines are basically, you know, various molecules that are secreted or excreted by muscle, probably when it's damaged or disrupted. And they sort of tell the rest of your body like, fuck, something's wrong, fuck. And the rest of your ability and performance and, and recovery probably declines to some extent. So that's maybe one of the ways in which even if your central nervous system is healed, doing a huge lower body session today can interfere with the productivity of your upper body session tomorrow because you still have a high level of circulatory cytokine presence. And that might be essentially a messenger system to tell your body like, look, it's not everything's okay. So let's not try super hard on this, this upper body work. Cause you could just fucking just take such a huge toll that, you know, something really bad could happen. And remember like your body's not super designed to grow muscle. It's designed to survive in a natural adaptive environment. And it's going to pull the put the brakes on you pretty fucking hard, especially if you're not used to the shit. So I think that uh, one of the curiosities people will discover as they get bigger and stronger is that systemic fatigue starts to be a little bit more limiting than they've ever seen. That sometimes it hits them in the face. like, what the fuck is this even? Like I've had messages from people being like, oh, so my squat's starting to affect my bench. How the fuck does that work? And I would explain <laughs> systemic fatigue and they're like, oh fuck, well that sucks. And I'm like, yeah, welcome yeah. to being advanced. We told you it sucked. You didn't listen. You wanted to be advanced. So it's one of those things. But but the cool thing is, is where that comes back to the kind of advice bodybuilders have been giving over literally decades of get proper sleep, get proper nutrition, get proper rest. Don't freak out about stuff that's none of your fucking business because that all accumulates fatigue and it accumulates systemic fatigue. It clearly stressing out over your girlfriend is not attacking your quads directly. She's like, fuck you. I never should have moved in. You're like, baby, my quads <laughs> don't say things like that. <laughs> but <laughs> How dare you? I can see, see them shrinking. But, you know, the systemic uh, 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 fatigue, especially through the nervous system, 
is definitely something that accumulates. So what ends up happening is, you know, you have to control that much more of your life, worry and not worry, or the opposite of worry, just be on top of your recovery much more because even if you're getting pretty decent workouts locally, uh, the systemic recovery issue will come up more and more as you get more advanced. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Steve, I don't know if I, I feel like I don't want to take your role here, but that brought to mind the segue. I think we're going to talk about the, the Schoenfeld volume um, study that has been just um, kind of beaten to death. Um, did you want to talk about that a bit today? Because I, I had a, a, an interesting insight that I don't know if I've seen anyone talk about. It's nothing actually extraordinary, but kind of obvious, to be honest. But I thought it would be worthwhile to mention. Yeah. I was only going to say, um, just to summarize again, what you guys just you have maybe different um, methods, the same principle of creating sufficient volume that you can recover from throughout a mesocycle, accumulate fatigue, knowing that you've got that fatigue, overloading to a point where you're going to have to taper, deload. I know in Fortitude, it's kind of blast and cruise and generally, Mike, the kind of accumulation and deload par paradigms. And from what I've seen from both of you, you're kind of weeks of doing kind of the overload and then the weeks of cruising to deloading is very, very similar. So um, I think a lot that will kind of solve a lot of people's kind of, they think you're kind of black and white, whereas there's kind of just, you're both in the mix of the gray, which is brilliant. And yeah, I think the volume paper would be a great talking point. And just so we kind of know for the listeners, know what we're talking about, obviously it's the Brad Schoenfeld, who was the kind of key author of that. And they had kind of the low, medium volume groups for the eight weeks um, and the high volume group got the most growth and they were doing like 30 to 45 sets per week uh, per muscle group um, mm -hmm. or per body body parts so uh, yeah if you want to go off on that Scott that'd be fantastic well, I was just looking at that I hadn't looked at it for a while I know it's that's been there's so many there's so much online and I, I was just thinking about it because Mike was what we we're talking about here and so here's the training that these they're they're trainees. This is just just one thing which I think people can do if they're um, they wanted to evaluate research is look at the subjects, a very obvious one, and see how applicable that would be to me. So these subjects had at least one year training experience. As it turned out, their squats and their bench one rep maxes were pretty much the same. Like they were, I don't I don't think they did a um, just a comparison, but the numbers were pretty much dead on like roughly about 100, 110 kilos. So that tells you something about their training experience. And here's the workouts that they did. This is just like, as an example, not to try to pick on, on, on Brad's study per se, but it, it shines something interesting to it. So they did, um, let's see, where is it? It was, uh, these were the exercises they used every workout. So they had did one set, three set, or five sets of each of these exercises with 90 seconds rest between each set and then two minutes rest between each exercises. As far as I could tell, there was no warm up. Um, and they're doing 10 to 12 rep, uh, or excuse me, eight to 12 repetitions, quote, carried out to the point of momentary concentric failure. So they started with flat barbell bench, barbell military press, wide grip lateral pull down, seated cable row, barbell back squat, machine leg press, and unilateral machine knee extension. So imagine, so we're just gonna imagine that you're not a, uh, uh, someone maybe as strong as, let's say you're someone who's more of an intermediate. You've got, I don't know, let's say something like, um, you could handle for those, for those reps, about a 10 rep max, the two and a quarter bench press. So you do, a set to, to failure with two and a quarter. Um, and then you have 90 seconds. You do another set, 90 seconds, do another set. They probably have to drop the load down. You do another set and then you do another set. And then two minutes later, without a warm up, you go to a military press, which you could normally do for 185, let's say, and maybe you struggle through that. And then you do four more sets there. No warm up. you go right to a lat pull down because you only got two minutes to get from one exercise to the other. You do lat pull downs for five more sets, cable rows for five more sets, and then you go to a squat just after you've done the cable row, and you're going to squat to failure for a set of 10, and then another set of 10, another one, another one, another one, and then you go to a leg press, which might be like eight plates for you. So you, you've just squatted five sets to failure, and you've done that in eight minutes, roughly. And now you're going to go to a leg press and do five sets to failure on the leg press and then move to a knee extension to do five more sets. 
that would send me to the hospital. I would probably have rhabdomyolysis if I tried to do that. I would be one effed up motherfucker. So I only, I only say that and, and, and not that we can take that whichever way we'd like to go. But if you look at that protocol, um, I would have sandbagged that. If I had to go and do that three times a week, I'd be sandbagging my ass off because there's no way I, I would have disruptive sleep. I'd be really pretty hurt, hurting pretty badly. Um, and so if you're someone who's, who's capable of lifting, let's say 200 quarter for a set of 10 on the bench or doing a four on five pound squat or 315 or what have you, um, could you do those workouts? And that points, at least for those individuals to the idea of external validity is this, is this the results of this study applicable to me? Could I actually carry out any of those training regimes? Now the one set, yes, um, that would be doable. That didn't take very long at all. Three sets, that would be three sets of squats to failure in the 10 rep max. After all that, that'd be pretty dang diabolical. Five sets, no way. So I just wanted to toss that out. That's the type of thing that would not be sustainable, I don't think, at least not for me. And probably a lot of people who are more concerned about this, this study as far as representative of the idea of, of more volume being better. And just to say, like, this really doesn't apply to you as an, an intermediate or advanced person if you don't think, given your strength level, that you could actually uh, carry out those workouts. So that's one way that people can kind of, like, rectify, I think, in their minds. Like, okay, how, how much weight do I have to put on this study? Does this even matter for me? No. So I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to beat my head against the wall worrying about it. So I wanted to throw that out as a, maybe as a starting point for that because it seemed to apply to the context of our conversation. No, I think that was really well described. I think a lot of people don't realize the training protocol that people are going through. They don't know the context there at all. So I think that was great to hear. And I know Mike's, you've said some words on it before, but um, if you've got some thoughts on what Scott said there and just in general on that study, what do you think? So I think that was, uh, Scott, that was really excellent input. Um, You know, I've taken a look at a lot of these training studies over the years and squinted at them and be like, what the fuck? (laughs) <laughs> How the hell are these people alive? Um, or man, they must have sandbag. You know, I've like conducted my fair share of training studies and been the person spotting these folks. And it's also pretty well known that intermediates and, and, be, and beginners, uh, their perception of what failure is is sometimes up to twelve reps off. Oh yeah. So you know they're not going there and doing Jordan Peters type shit. Because Jordan Peters. I think would die halfway through the first five set workout. Like he would oh, just yeah. literally just drop dead. <laughs> uh, we, you and I would be very close behind. Um, so there's definitely, you know, the training, the way people think it looks, it's not actually ecologically applied. that difficult. It's very difficult, but it's not that difficult. Just looking at the numbers. I think people look like, Oh, they did like five sets of 15 in the squat. And they think they're 15 RM on a great day. And they're like, they did five of that? Like, no, they didn't do five of that shit. You know, they could have been lifting 50 pounds at the end for, for all we know. Um, and that's good because otherwise they would have fucking been in real deep shit. The only real thing, maybe not the only, the biggest thing I take away from the Schoenfeld study and the, the, the studies that it, the, one of the studies that it was designed to replicate and uh, several other studies like it is this. The amount of training you could potentially benefit from might be higher than you think. So if you think you might be under training, here's what you can do. Do not start doing 45 sets all of a sudden. Do what James Krieger, who was a co-author of the study, recently did with his own training. This is actually a really, really great example. So James, he's been in the evidence-based bodybuilding crowd for literally like two decades. He's been training for like two or three decades. And he's a hard gainer guy. He's supposed to be a skinny guy. He's like, you know, pretty well built now. But he's basically said that he hadn't done more than like 20 sets per body part per week, like ever. And like much more than 12, really ever. Because like, you know, um, this guy, you know who Lyle McDonald is, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I do love him. Say that again. Are you you really you're enamored with him quite a bit. He's from like a father that I wish I had, but I got uh, my dad instead. Yeah, it's a huge disappointment for me in my right. life. 
Yeah, life's um, full of disappointments. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. If you're a lie, it's full of a lot more. I'm totally <laughs> kidding. I'm not really kidding. So uh, in any case, you know, it's, it's kind of like the sort of Lyle McDonald, natty crowd of like fear over training, like it's coming for you no matter what. And anyone who does more than 10 sets per body part per week is just fucking nuts. So I think James came more from that, not that idea, but that tradition and then him and Brad put out this 45 set study and James did the statistics and he was like, what the fuck? So he was like, okay, what am I going to do? So he started at his normal training volumes. Literally this happened over the last several months. He started where he usually trained. And then he just, if he was recovering fine and he wasn't sore when he was supposed to be training again, he would like add a set here and there, just add a set, maybe add a set once every two weeks, sometimes once a week, sometimes once a workout, as his body showed that, hey, we're good, we're still recovering, good to go. So as he did that, he eventually got into like the high 20s or 30s and got like way more hypertrophy than he had literally in like decades or something like that. Mm. He was like, oh my God. Mm. But that's exactly the kind of way you take that study of Schoenfeld and apply it correctly is – it just gives you this glimpse like, hey, you, you might be training too much. You might be training just enough. But you, you over there, you might not be training enough. You just have no fucking clue. So if you think you're that person, slowly add volume and see how you respond. Because I'll tell you what, if you're not that person and you start adding volume, and you're already close to your maximum recovery volume, within a couple of weeks, you're just going to get super tired. You're not going to be able to perform. You're going to feel like shit. Your muscles are going to lose glycogen. You're going to look softer or like more depleted. And you're going to be like, well, that fucking blows. I guess it just fucking didn't work. That's it. And, and you, you might try it again because you think, okay, well, I had a bad month. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't sleeping right. You'll try it again. And again, it fails. I think two or three times into that process for whatever muscle group you're trying to higher volumes with, yeah, you just, that's it. You just, you know, you found your MRV. And, and it's just a number that's probably not going to change much. So stick within what you normally do. Even then, try going a little lower. Some people are chronically too close to their maximum recoverable volume. They could benefit by going way lower than they think. Like I remember when I discovered actually quite recently that my tri – like I have really fast twitch dominant triceps. Like I can overhead press a shitload, do a shitload of dips. And I realized my minimum effective volume for direct tricep work was like four sets per week per mm. week i was like what the fuck why am i pissing away my time hurting my elbows doing like 15 when i could have just grown a ton and i switched it. i went four six eight ten deload and then i googled like my triceps visibly improved and i've been training for like 20 years i was like oh my god this is i feel so stupid not having applied my own principle mm. you think like there's no way like i have guys message me like there so like you say that if you get a pretty good pump and you're getting a little sore it's probably growing muscle i get that from like four sets of shoulders a week what do i do i'm like try training four sets a week and they're mm -hmm. like, that can't be enough. I'm like, are you progressing? They're like, yeah. I'm like, what the fuck more do you want? And they're like, I don't know. I feel like it should be more like, you're literally telling me it's too easy to grow muscle and you want it to be harder. That's what you're saying. Like, I get it. I get it. I get it. So I think it just, that study goes to show that you might be a person that responds to really low volume. Maybe you're like your lower volume tier. You might be a person that's right in the middle. Or you might be a person that just has exotic recovery abilities. You just never knew it. One of the super cool, interesting findings from some of Brad's other studies is that non-responders are actually typically individuals probably slower twitch that just have really high minimum effective volumes and thus really high maximum recover volumes so a study that goes from three sets a week to eight sets a week might just barely touch their minimum effective volume their maximum recoverable could be 35 sets a week and start at 10. so for them doing more volume could just be the solution they were looking for. And it seems like more hard gainers are people who just aren't training enough, not because they're not hardcore, because they're not fucking you know, like, oh, fucking sacrifice and grind that bullshit. It's because they just literally don't know. And all the other programs that are around them, especially in the evidence-based community tend to be so conservative. So to be honest, properly taken i think the schoenfeld study was fucking great for the evidence-based communities like the thing is like i i float in both communities like you know like the pro community like the bodybuilding hardcore fucking for lack of a better term special sports supplement scene you don't have to tell those people to train hard they fucking know no, but for no. the evidence-based community they're like oh are you sure i don't know like look if you're not recovering totally you're doing too much but if you push your volume and you're just recovering and growing recovering growing, fucking measurably calmly slowly with 
checking your feedback to see if everything is recovering. Just oh, up, 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 up. I promise you'll probably just get tired. You're not going to break in half. I remember one time Lyle was being interviewed by some dude from Germany, and, and they were just essentially mocking the maximum recovery volume concept. And he's like, uh, so, so Lyle, what do you think about like uh, training uh, until you like uh, you basically get hurt? Is that like good? And, and Lyle's like, no, that's really stupid. And he's like, yeah, that's so stupid. And I'm like, wow, you guys have me all figured out. But that's all I've been saying. Like that's what Dr. Mike's been saying this whole time is a train until you literally die. Then deload, you'll come back as a zombie and they're going to be huge. Right. Fuck out of here. A, a much smarter zombie. Of right. course, and zombies you know, tend to be more you know not to make the same mistake. <laughs> exactly. He's just like, food, brains. And you're like, do you want more volume? He's like, no, no more volume. You're like, ah, he learned. <laughs> He's gigantic. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I, you know, another way to sort of look at what you're saying as far as that study goes is that um, just like you see with responders and non-responders, there's, you know, a, a bell curve. Some people respond really well. Some people are quote non-responders for a given training stimulus in a given yes. particular study. And you also see the same thing. And this is in the, the, um, the Wernbaum review study review article from like 2007, where he, he looked at frequency and volume, what have you. And you see the same thing across studies too. Like there's yes. this tremendous distribution and this is just one study yes. that points sort of to one end of the distribution of what you can get results wise in this particular circumstances in terms of like 45 sets, like you wouldn't necessarily do that, but you know that this, that's within the realm of possibility of working for some people and you might be that person. Yeah. So you can look at it it's in that not way, likely, but you might be that person. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And you, you would know, I mean, gosh, when I was, I spent years, but I always knew I liked to train really, really hard. And I, I would do like 20 sets of 20, 20 reps and squats thinking more is better. This is like, you know, back at just, I just, if only, only if it were that way, it took me quite a while to figure that out. And that's when I eventually wound around to doing more of a DC training type of program. And then I started actually doing dog crap training, but um, yeah, so I, I like, I like how you phrase that. And so, someone who looks at those, the, that training system and that workout would say, well, this is obviously not for me. I couldn't, I wouldn't know how to hold all the reps in reserve that those people had to obviously do. I mean, I wouldn't know how to train in that way. Um, what, you know, how would that actually even pan out? I don't know. You can also look across a gym and, and you may experience this when you go train somewhere. I, I experience this just a lot of times is like, I don't spend much time looking around the gyms, but you can, you know, when someone is really just, just getting after it, like their life depends on it. They, they stay, they stand out. It's actually a very, very rare thing. That's sure. one of the reasons why Jordan, other than the fact he's just, you know, ginormous is, has such a great following. He trains just about as hard as is humanly possible as often as he possibly can. That's extraordinary. So, if you look across your average LA fitness, e even among a lot of the guys who are pretty well developed, those guys are holding lots of reps in reserve. Like this information from the Schoenfeld study might actually be like you in the exact way you said, be applicable for them because there are a lot of people yeah. that just, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a really bizarre thing to want to go and train until you're about to bleed from your eyes. That's just not what pe most people want to do unless you've got, you know, that masochistic tendency, which, you know, either happened with some which family trauma human or being whatever. like me would know nothing about. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or you really. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. So, so most people probably could get something from that, you know, and you would know it, you'd have probably learned it you know, long beforehand. So um, yeah, I like the way we've, we've kind of figured out how to take, you can always take something good from every study, even if it's like, that's what I'll never do. Um, yes, so yes. that's, yeah, that's an important part that, you know, hasn't come out with the Lyle, James back and forth and Brad, like they've been just ripping. That was everyone. a fucking disaster, huh? Oh, I, yeah, I read through a lot of that. It was just like, oh my God, tit for tat for tit for tat ad infinitum. It was just Great. mind boggling. That's yeah. what keeps our community alive, Scott, is pointless <laughs> drama, name calling. Yes. That's the lifeblood of, of the evidence-based bodybuilding hey, community. Hey, Steve, do you want do you want a little snippet to put in your in your show like preview? <laughs> I was just gonna say you haven't provided me that right yeah, now. Yeah, it's great. It's Ready? Okay. 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 <laughs> well, you, you know what? That's bullshit, Scott, and I won't fucking have it. <laughs> okay, I'm done. This is it.
<laughs> that's that? it. You got, you got, that's it. Is that good enough? We will like use that. 10 it's great brilliant. seconds of like, just, it's so funny. You please, can you please do that and bait people with it? And they're like, oh my God. And then it's an hour and a half of cordial discussion. Like, this is bullshit. I want to refund, unsubscribe from Patreon. Fuck you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> the, the ridiculous thing is anyone who knows either of you knows that would never be how it would go down. <laughs> well, that's oh, what would make us want to click. They'd just be like, I can't believe this. Yeah, true. And, <laughs> and it has to be that asshole Steve who got him so wound up. <laughs> yes, yeah, Steve, Steve's the guy in the background pulling the fucking really strings. That. <laughs> we, we know it's you antagonizing your guests. Um, like always. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, Mike, I know you need to be gone in like five minutes, so oh, geez, yeah. I think yeah. that, that was a good roundup of we covered off um, lots of bits on training volume, obviously that study, relative intensities, and then just obviously the different methodologies you have and applying those and really seeing a lot of kind of similarities and not the big differences that maybe some people see. Um, and I know just because p- people will end up pigeonholing and be like, Scott's the kind of training to failure guy. If I train to failure, I just tag him and I'm like, that Like that means what I did was right. And people pigeonhole Mike is kind of the volume guy and it really, it's neither or. Um, so thank you very much for coming on and discussing this. And I'm sure there may be questions. And if you guys would oblige, I think it would be brilliant to get you on and discuss things in future. But yeah, thank you both for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us, Steve. Scott, a true pleasure. Yeah, likewise, my friend. Um, and, you know, if you ever want, like, you know, come on down to Florida. You're welcome <laughs> down here. Yeah, I'll nice let you know when my home. wife finishes her residency in Philip fucking Delphia. Oh, really I, yeah, I was actually born there. I spent only two years, though. My dad was in residency in, in Philly um, <laughs> when go. I was a kid. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yahoo. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Right, guys. And we'll talk to you soon. Yep. Gracias.